Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to a new episode of Pulp Today. I have with me here the lovely and talented Emily Edwards, Hello. novelist and host of the Fuck Boys of Lit podcast, which is as delightful as she is. Um, <laughs> Thank Emily, you. Emily was kind enough to invite me on to talk about uh, James Bond in Casino Royale. Yeah. In a, Excellent episode that you should uh, hunt down. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What's what? Who have you been talking about lately? What are your, what are your recent episodes of? Oh about? golly, um, we just did a Kurt Vonnegut book. We did Cat's oh. Cradle, which is just filled with all sorts of mid-century fun stuff. We just did Hamlet, um, which was great with Sadie Doyle. She was fantastic. Oh, that must have been great. Yeah, she's that great had a bunch of other people on and uh, we're working on a bunch of fun stuff that's gonna sort of get through genres and different texts and things like that too. Great. So we like covering comics, plays, everything. I can. noticed that. I know you did Doc Manhattan pretty early. Yeah, in yeah. In your run. Did Batman too. Which yeah, is a well, movie. he's a giant fuck boy. I mean, so, absolutely. Yeah, we should, you should, uh, I'll, I'll do one if you ever want to do Zorro. We can, oh yes, we can, definitely. We can talk shit a lot of shit about Batman during a Zorro yeah. episode because <laughs> Batman's a total ripoff. <laughs> and Zorro, I always like to say, Zorro at least enjoys what he's doing. He helps yeah. the rest with a smile on his face, not like a giant moody asshole dressed. Like that. <laughs> That's all we ask. Yeah. <laughs> Zorro calls himself, he's called the fox, but he's not walking around with like a fox head on his head like, yes. like an idiot, you know. <laughs> I say that with love. Um, I would like to work for DC Comics someday. So exactly. I really should stop saying that kind of stuff. So uh, I think you've seen some episodes of this and you know that I'm mostly talking about pulp fiction writers. Mm -hmm. uh, I am fairly broad in my definition of pulp and The New Yorker was certainly not a pulp magazine. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, but that said, uh, Dorothy Parker is from a certain period and does have a certain <laughs> tang to her writing, yeah. which is not unfamiliar. And in doing my research for this, I, uh, I have my beloved copy of the portable Dottie Parker. And, uh, I found in it this morning, a review of the glass key, which is one of the most schizophrenic things I have ever read in my life. <laughs> because uh, she's ashamed by how much she loves Dashiell Hammett. She really, <laughs> she really wants to make sure you know that she doesn't think it's literature. Oh, how kind. I mean, literally, she devotes a paragraph to how he's not Hemingway. Oh, how nice. And then says, but it's so great. I love it so much. It's the best. <laughs> I I, I, like it's, this. it's not Hemingway or anything. Don't get, uh, don't get the wrong okay. idea. It's a good thing he's not Hemingway. Yeah, well, exactly. It's a, it's a. I think it's, I, I, I think it's a, a pure positive that he's not Hemingway. Um, I think at the time she wrote that, there was still this. To this day, there's this idea that if you write in short, clipped, clear sentences, you're Hemingway, and it's like, you know, people were talking like that for a long time before Hemingway came along, and because people can't juggle clauses and they don't know the idea, they've never diagrammed a sentence. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's not a lot of sentence diagramming going on out there yeah. in the world. Uh, but anyway, I it's it and that struck me as really funny, and she talks about how much she just uh, that her two dream men from <laughs> literature were Sam Spade and Lancelot. Uh, God, that explains so much about Dorothy Parker. <laughs> right? So she likes the guy that uh, is absolutely willing to send you to prison. Yeah. Uh, even though he loves you. And she likes the guy that sleeps with his best friend's wife. Yep. And starts a war over that. So. <laughs> cool. Okay, Dottie. Good, Let's good, not touch good that. On <laughs> I also wanted to talk for a second about um, her screenwriting work. Mm. Um, she wrote... You ever see the Hitchcock movie Saboteur? I, yes, I have. It's hard to watch that and go, where's the Dorothy Parker in here? Yeah. But halfway through the movie, while he's running away from the G-Man, he's been framed for a sabotage mm -hmm. act, uh, hence the title. He gets on a train with a bunch of circus freaks. Yes! And they are a complete representation of America's underclass 
and basically she gets out a thesis statement in there that everybody else in the movie is fucking worthless except these circus freaks yeah. good pe- circus freaks are good people man and it cracks me up that she like yeah, right. let's take five minutes out in this hitchcock movie because that yeah. i i don't think that comes from somebody else that doesn't seem like a hitchcockian no. uh, take no. on humanity to go no man the freaks yeah we're in trouble yeah, with the cops bad. run straight yeah. to the freaks and the cops are actually the bad guys here yeah. Yeah, the cops are the bad guys, even though he's been wrongly framed. It's not like Hitchcock draws a particularly uh, no. attractive uh, portrait of the police. Um, so I, I thought, I remember watching that a bunch of years ago and going, oh, this is a weird little scene. And then I looked yeah. up the credits. Yeah. yeah. One of these things is not like the other. Yeah. So you have a piece you want to read. I want to read this first page from Dusk Before Fireworks. Have you ever read that one? I don't think so. One of her short stories. It has sort of a famous opening line, uh, but uh, the whole first paragraph. And it's that the thing that always, I mean, maybe it's my upbringing, but the thing that always sounds like detective fiction for me, and it's prevalent in all of Dorothy Parker, who was clearly influenced by Hammett, Mm -hmm. uh, is the, the paragraph of description of a character that is just devastatingly, bitingly accurate mm-hmm. and cruel and cold-hearted. And uh, so this so is, this is, uh, this is a little bit of that. And I'm going to jump over, yeah, I'm going to jump over one paragraph, but there are two paragraphs here that are just terrific. Here, so uh, let me go to speaker view. Oh. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> all right. Dust, dust before fireworks. He was a very good-looking young man indeed, shaped to be annoyed. His voice was intimate as the rustle of sheets, and he kissed easily. There, were no, there was no tallying the gifts of Charvet hand, handkerchiefs, art modern, ashtrays, monogram dressing gowns, gold keychains, and cigarette cases of thin wood inlaid with views of Parisian comfort stations that were sent him by ladies too quickly confident and were paid for with the money of unwitting hu- husbands, which is acceptable any place in the world. Every woman who visited his small square apartment promptly flamed with the desire to assume charge of its redecoration. During his tenancy, three separate ladies had achieved this ambition. Each had left behind her, for her brief monument, much too much glazed chintz. Uh, The very good looking young man was stretched in a chair that was legless and short and back. It was a strain to see in that chair any virtue save the speeding one of modernity. Certainly it was a peril to all who dealt with it. They were far from their best within its arms, and they could never wish to be remembered as they appeared while easing into its depths or struggling out again. All that is, save the young man. He was a long young man, broad in the shoulders and chest and narrow everywhere else, and his muscles obeyed him at the exact stand, at the exact instant of command. He rose and lay, he moved and was still, always in beauty. Several men disliked him, but only one woman really hated him. She was his sister. She was stump shaped and she had straight hair. <laughs> anyway, uh, I dig that passage for many reasons, not all of them professional. Uh, that was actually something that I noticed too when I was going through my co- abridged complete stories of Dorothy Parker of just how often her stories begin with the absolutely most perfect succinct way of describing someone so you knew exactly why she hated them and you should too yeah yeah so what are you going to read for us so i have the original couple paragraphs from the waltz which is i think one of her stories that captures um feminine tension really well And to me, that just says, like, she's very good at capturing just that, the panic feeling. Oh, yeah. It's inherent in mysteries and pulp and and stories of suspense, so. Absolutely. Well, have at it. Cool. Why, thank you so much. I'd adore to. 
I don't want to dance with him. I don't want to dance with anybody. And even if I did, it wouldn't be him. He'd be well down among the last 10. I've seen the way he dances. It looks like something you do on St. Valpurgis night. Just think, not a quarter of an hour ago, here I was sitting feeling so sorry for the poor girl he was dancing with. And now I'm going to be the poor girl. Well, well, isn't it a small world? And a peach of a world, too. A true little corker. It, its events are so fascinatingly unpredictable, are they not? Here I was, minding my own business, not doing a stitch of harm to any living soul. And then he comes into my life, all smiles and city manners, to sue me for the favor of one memorable mazurka. Why, he scarcely knows my name, let alone what it stands for. It stands for despair, bewilderment, futility, degradation, and premeditated murder. But little does he want. I don't want his name either. I haven't any idea what it is. Jukes would be my guess from the look in his eyes. How do you do, Mr. Jukes? And how is that dear little brother of yours with the two heads? And now, why did he have to come around me with his low requests? Why can't he leave me, leave me alive, my life? <laughs> why can't he let me leave my life alone? I ask so little just to be left alone in my quiet corner of the table to do my evening brooding over all my sorrows. And he must come with his bows and his scrapes and his may I have this ones. And I had to go and tell him that I'd adore to dance with him. I cannot understand why I wasn't struck down dead. Yes, being struck dead would look like a day in the country could ever compared to struggling out to dance with this boy. But what could I do? Everyone else at the table had got up to dance except him and me. There I was trapped, trapped like a trap in a trap. <laughs> that is fantastic. She's it's, so good. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny what you said about the, that focus on uh, a certain kind of internal decision making and panic and anxiety. Uh, I read this morning a story called The Lovely Leave, which may have been her first short story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about a woman who has just found out her lieutenant in the Air Force, uh, boyfriend or husband, I'm not sure it's clear, has got a leave, a brief leave. And she, it's all about self-sabotage. <laughs> Yeah. She's instantly jealous of the guys laughing in the background on his phone call, his fellow pilots, because he cares more about them in her mind. Yeah. Because he's going off to fight the war with them, and they're a great bunch of fellows, and they're, I love them, and all that. And she's like, what about me, me, me? There's a great line where she says, you've gone off to a new, a whole new life, and you've left me with half an old life. Oh. Isn't that great? Yeah. And uh, and the best thing about it is she knows, and certainly Dor Dorothy Parker knows writing the story, she knows she's wrong. She yeah. knows she's creating her own dismal internal life yeah. with petty jealousies, but she also knows she can't help it. Yeah, she exactly. Can't, she can't do a thing about it. And obviously, yeah. as in the, the thing you just read, it's all about, I said yes, and why the hell did I say yes? Yeah, I could have said no, but I didn't, and everybody would have felt bad for me if I was just sitting there alone, but now they feel bad for me because I'm with this clod, and everything is terrible, And but she's still going to the damn party, and she's still dancing. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. When yeah. did you discover Dorothy Parker, do you remember? Oh, high school. You know, I think it was a bunch of teachers going, oh dear, we have this feminist smart ass. Here's your patron saint. And yeah. that was a lot of it. Probably yeah, I can, I can see. I, there are certain authors who are probably the go-to. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were more humorless about it, they probably would have thrown Margaret Atwood at you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like, oh, but she's funny, so it should be Dottie Parker. If yeah. she's angrier... <laughs> Yeah, well, she's single and melancholy, but cracks jokes yeah. about it. So yeah, yeah. So if you're if there's cynicism and humor, you get Dottie Parker. If you're, exactly. If you're a little more angry and a little more revolutionary, you get Margaret Atwood. Um, <laughs> and that's you know, it's yeah. uh, it's it is interesting how authors become such totems for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no shame in, you know, I don't know if Dorothy Parker is a totem for you. She, you know, she's certainly a great. You know, she certainly is for me. I, you know, she's just always been sort of a guiding light for me of dealing with like mental issues and to always kind of approach things with 
you know, a levity that mm -hmm. it might be a defense mechanism to make people more comfortable with it, but it's uh, the greatest coping mechanism I've found yeah. with, you know. And it's also, I mean, in, in Parker, I think there's, there's a, uh, such a healthy self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how well she applied that in the living of her daily life. Yeah, probably not super well. But you can see yourself making the mistakes in slow motion and mm -hmm. write about them endlessly and still continue to make yeah. mistakes in slow motion. Yeah, and she was such a phenomenal critic of society too. And she did it all with the humor that she had. You know, she was a she was blacklisted in Hollywood. She gave money to the NAACP. She just like knew how to cut people to the quick and generally speaking, force people to like actually think about yeah. what they were doing rather than laugh at her. Sure. And wasn't, if I remember correctly, didn't she leave all of her money to the NAACP when she died? She did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which again, like in 2020 that feels different than it did in what when did she die in the 60s yeah in the 60s in like 67 I yeah think. that was a far more revolutionary act yeah uh, she left uh, all of her money to martin luther king jr and then when he died it got forwarded right. on yeah. that's right uh which is again it's just a remarkable yeah she is definitely one of those she put her money where her mouth was at all times and and absolutely suffered for it mm -hmm. uh but uh it's interesting in the uh, in the introduction to this, the editor says that since they introduced the Penguin Portable Libraries, they've gone through a lot of convulsions, but three of them always remained in print. Her, the Bible, and what was the third one? And Shakespeare, which is just kind of, of all of the stuff to survive. Yeah, um, and you never know, collapse I, print. Yeah, and I think it, it she'd be fascinated by the fact that the poetry is still quoted mm -hmm. still remembered all of that did you see the movie the uh jennifer jason lee movie no there's a jennifer jason lee movie called mrs parker and the vicious circle Ugh. um and it's interesting casting choice what's that it's an interesting casting choice she's better than i she's very good actually okay. um the uh the one casting choice that doesn't work at all is the world's thinnest man campbell scott mm -hmm. plays benchley <laughs> and all the pillows in the world cannot turn <laughs> campbell scott into robert benchley and the thing is i don't mean to be uh reductive of benchley either he also if he had benchley specific charm that i wouldn't care yeah. uh, but he really that. he doesn't have benchley's specific kind of charm so it doesn't yeah. uh it doesn't work well uh, ever, ever since i moved out here i've had the visual in my head of having a dorothy parker movie with jenny slate because i think she would just nail that sad sharpness sure possibly. no i think that's a good especially from from uh, who's around today that's a yeah, exactly. you know, and from the age she should have been another interesting thing i got from the forward to this which I think is a probably jaundiced perspective, but that her reputation, that basically the Algonquin round table wasn't 30 bright shining superstars. It was maybe three yeah. and a lot of hangers on and third raters. And yeah. uh, that she, her reputation literarily may have suffered from who her buddies were. Yeah. Uh, who she was palling around with rather than, uh, her actual work. But you know, you look at her, you look at Mary McCarthy, who she reminds me of. I mean, they're sort of cut from a similar cloth in some ways. Uh, the uphill battle to be that woman in that time uh, and to always be the woman, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, in the crowd of yeah. dudes. Yeah, uh, and to be very obviously and unapologetically Jewish in the way that she presented herself as well is yeah. just, you know, she's an upper middle class Jewish girl from New Jersey. Like yeah. that's not opening many doors for you in the 1930s. No, and even worse, her uh, original name, Rothschild, mm -hmm. invokes all of the worst stereotypes in the world. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, her, her, her name is literally Dorothy Zionist Conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, and Jews have all the money. Like that's yeah. literal, her name is Jew, literally Dorothy Jewish Gold. 
Yeah. And, uh, that's a, I'm sure that's one of the many reasons she was happy to get rid of it and stay rid of it. Because uh, the, the waspy last names. Yeah, all of the waspy last names uh, and the waspy husbands. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating life and it's, uh, it's, it's good to keep the name out there. Uh, and again, I just thought her, her particular voice, when you suggested Dorothy Parker, I was like, oh yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. I mean, uh, you know, no, no, the, the New Yorker was not printed on cheap paper. Yeah. Uh, but particularly reading that, reading the, the embarrassed love of Dashiell Hammett, I went, <laughs> now I kind of see where there was a giant influence on you that, you know, you weren't really clocking <laughs> out loud and you were ashamed. <laughs> exactly. and even though a lot of, you know, a lot of her writing predates what must have been her you know she says I read Hammett as a child I'm like mm, probably not short stories you're an adult when those yeah. are written <laughs> you were born in the 1890s you were probably not a kid when you were reading these yeah yeah, yeah. it's not quite uh but I think she's more saying that her res her response to uh her response to Sam Spade and Dashiell Hammett is a schoolgirl response. I think yeah. that's why she's categorizing her. You know, she's she's imagining she was a schoolgirl because that's how Dashiell Hammett makes it feel. <laughs> exactly, and that's so interesting to think of that. Like when she is writing about uh, her characters and men, they're always in high society. They're never in low society. And for her to be like, "Well, Sam Spade speaks to me," and it's like, "Oh." Yeah. You probably wish you could have like a grimy detective, but since yeah. you wrote for the New Yorker, you can't. Yeah, no, and, and she doesn't she doesn't feel Ned Beaumont from The Glass Key lives quite up to Sam Spade. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I Spade is sharper and funnier than Ned. I think Ned is probably a better person deep down inside. <laughs> uh, but that's a that's a that's a thin line. Uh, yeah, it's a very thin line between those two characters uh, in terms of morality, but uh, but yeah, no, she definitely had the that sharp, deadly, clear eye thing down, and mm -hmm. uh, that's so much a a part of uh, that kind of fish, fiction. She fits in beautifully with it. Yeah, I just love the way she uses lingo in her stories because you wouldn't expect a woman of her society to you know, it's kind of a true little corker, what a peach of a world, you know, right. and just things like that. It's just delightful that she shows her frayed edges. You oh, know. sure. Well, and also she's speaking in the language of the time instead of some, some you know, false, you yes, know, aristocratic radio, radio announcer, mid-Atlantic yeah. uh, American speech, which no one actually speaks except news announcers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and Hammett was obviously very big into that. Kane was into that. And, you know, it's uh, to use the actual vernacular. My biggest surprise when I first read William Burroughs uh, mm -hmm. as a pretty young guy, um, you know, I came to it knowing it had this literary sheen on it, that these were, you know, books of great import in the world and all that. And then I read them and I said, William Burroughs sure sounds like a Times Square sharp guy like my dad. Like he does, he talks like a World War II veteran in Manhattan in the 50s would. Yeah, not, exactly. you know, this is not a high tone literary voice no. by any way, shape, or form and uses vernacular. This is coming out of Exeter. Like. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, and it is fascinating what shapes all of these styles. But the leg, you know, the other thing I would say that connects her to uh, Dorothy Parker to someone like Kane, Kane's whole career, James M. Kane's whole career is about festering jealousy. It's about, yeah. uh, it's about how toxic it is to want something you can't have. Mm -hmm. uh, and to but you and can't stop yourself to, from wanting it. <laughs> yeah. And even, and even the, uh, even the, the consciousness that you know that you don't want it that much, that you've tricked yourself into wanting it that much, doesn't help you. Yeah. Um, and uh, in some of the Dorothy Parker I was reading, rereading this morning, uh, there, she really, she was with him on that, that whole idea of the, even in the clip that you read, the dichotomy between 
what you can convince yourself you want, yeah. what you're willing to publicly want, and what you actually <laughs> want are three completely different Wildly things. Different. Yeah. And to bring it back, one of my favorite last uh, late career quotes from William Burroughs, who I didn't think I'd be mentioning during this, um, in the Western lands, he says, how long does it take a man to realize he does not, cannot want what he wants? You can parse that a number of ways, mm -hmm. uh, but I always took it to mean you reach a certain age and you go, why did I spend all my time chasing that thing that I didn't really, that yeah. people convinced me that I should chase, that I convinced myself that I should chase? Uh, and I think there's a lot of that in uh, Dorothy Parker. I completely agree. <laughs> the earlier you can convince yourself of that, the better life is going to be. Absolutely. The earlier that you can figure out, oh, hey, that's just something. Yeah, I consciously perfect. remember that. Yeah. I, I consciously remember, you know, like accepting the idea that the culture tells you this is important. Okay, well, this is important. Mm -hmm. TV Guide says this is a very, a very good movie. So this must be a very good movie. No, no, it's not really how it works, actually. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's really strange. I, I, I learned, you know, it shouldn't surprise anybody that I was a big old weirdo when I was a teenager. And not to put too fine of a point on it, but a lot of it had to do with Dorothy Parker, reading it when I was her when I was 14, 15 years old and realizing there's things that she's told that she wants. She doesn't actually want their tension here. How quickly can you overthrow that tension in your own life and just be your own goddamn person? Yeah. And, you know, and again, she was her own goddamn person as much as many, she achieved that more than a lot of people. And still, if you asked her, she would probably tell you she achieved it very, very rarely. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're all sort of dissatisfied. Uh, I was rereading The Odyssey recently, and there was a translation of it years ago that started out, this is the story of a man who was never at a loss. That's not a good translation at all. Yeah. Uh, by the way. But I was always fascinated by that because I always thought, I always had the desire to write a, re rewrite the Odyssey from Odysse as first person singular by Odysseus. Uh -huh. And if I had done that, the first line would have been, here's a story of a man who was at a loss constantly. Constantly. <laughs> who was like constantly <laughs> back against the wall, out of ideas. Not an idea what to do. At out of option. <laughs> Just that, that tension between how they view you and how you're and how you view yourself mm -hmm. and uh, kind of trying to square those circles together uh, is, a, is a lifelong trick, mm -hmm. I think. And I don't know that, you know, you think about someone like Parker and, you know, at the end of her life, did she, did she know what she had achieved? Did she, did she know we'd still yeah. be talking about her, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. She, she tried to die by suicide three times in her life. Like, she was a tragic figure to an extent of that I don't think she was ever truly happy mm. and, you know, suffered from alcohol addiction her entire life, but hid it behind a cloak of high society. Sure. And, you know, she, I don't think she probably liked the class that she learned, mm. but, you know, she taught other people. So I guess yeah. that's the best you can hope for sometimes. Yeah. No, and she's, you know, she remains... In inspiration and she remains endlessly in print. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you're, let's see, mine is from reprinted in 78. Is this from 1978? It would explain the yellow pages. That's actually the, the exact copy that was on my bookshelf growing up. So yeah, probably from the 70s. No, it, 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 uh, it, came, it came around a lot. I don't actually remember. I'm actually surprised this one doesn't have uh, I worked in a used bookstore when I was a teenager. So 99% of my paperbacks right about oh, here sick. on the inside say, after you've read it, swap it for credit. The book swap, <laughs> Town, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, book swap, but there was a lot of pilfering. Um, <laughs> Sticky fingers. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think I sent the shop under, but uh, there was a lot of... My most blatant was a guy came in with the entire John Carter of Mars series by... Oh. Burroughs and by by Edgar Rice Burroughs and I was like these are just going right in my bag. Like, yeah, exactly. I'm even gonna joke or kid around and put them on the shelves for a minute. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for coming on. Thank Where you can people find Fuck Boys of Lit? 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter, which is Fuckboys of Lit, which is B O I S, uh, and fuckboysoflit.com, or me personally at Ms. Emily Edwards, spelled very traditionally. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, and the, the podcast can be listened to. Oh, pretty much everywhere podcasts are listened to. Uh, Apple is a great place to go. It's pretty much the industry standard. Spotify, uh, a whole bunch of other ones that I don't even know about. Overcast, Pocket Cast, all sorts. Just search for F-B-O-L because they don't like the word fuckboys on a lot of platforms. So, But I appreciate you using it because nothing would, nothing would say what you were trying to say better than that. You would, you. you would be lying. And you know what's funny? I think when you launched it, before I even knew what you were going to do with it, I was like, well, the first episode is going to be Heathcliff, right? Like, we're going to start with, uh, nope. I think it was Lord Byron. I it was remember. Lord Byron was the first episode. We yeah. haven't done Heathcliff yet. Really? How is yeah. that? He is the well, most. I don't want to read Wuthering Heights. <laughs> I, I know. I know. It's, uh, what was it? Someone asked me about, uh, someone asked me about The Last Man the other day because end of the world plague things and Mary Shelley. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to remember what I said now, but like Mary Shelley is her own worst enemy to me sometimes because The Last Man is literally all about how great Byron and Shelley are. Yeah. Like they appear sort of as, as pastiche characters and you're like, but you're so better than them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you not? Why, Mary Shelley? Why? You... You're like 17. Could have just run. <laughs> yeah. How do you not know you're better than them? Yeah, but, you know, it's just, uh, it's just funny to me. And I, I address that in my Elvira comic by having <laughs> Elvira very impressed with Mary Shelley and having no interest in. Oh, thank you. The great poets. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't think he did it on purpose, but. My artist drew Byron and Shelley looking an awful lot like Bill and Ted, <laughs> uh, which uh, I loved that. Like I said, he said, I wasn't really thinking about that, but yeah, I guess they are kind of Bill and Ted. Um, and now I want to make that movie. With Alex Winter and Keanu yeah. Reeves playing Byron and Shelley. Anyway, again, thank you so much for coming on. We'll do this again sometime. We'll pick another writer and uh, check out Emily's podcast, everyone. Thank you.